of the court. There have been no changes to Article 8 or Article 9 since the court issued its order a little over two years ago. There are no new facts that could cause the court to reach a different interpretation of these articles. Myanmar itself offers nothing new. Instead, it asks the court to reverse its determination on the basis of a purportedly in-depth analysis. But Myanmar has not been able to present a single authority of any sort to support its peculiar view that Article 8 governs the season of the court to hear a dispute between contracting parties under Article 9. As explained in the Gambia's written observations, and as I will recall briefly today, the terms of Article 8, its object and purpose, as well as the preparatory works of the Convention, demonstrate that Article 8 governs appeals to UN organs at a political level. It has no bearing on the season of the court to resolve a legal dispute between state parties. I begin with the ordinary meaning of the terms of Article 8. Madam President, as you can see in the screen before you, Article 8 provides, any contracting party may call upon the competent organs of the United Nations to take such action under the Charter of the United Nations as they consider appropriate for the prevention and suppression of acts of genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3. Upon Myanmar's accession to the Genocide Convention, it entered a reservation to Article 8, stating, with reference to Article 8, the Union of Burma makes the reservation that the said article shall not apply to the Union. Myanmar argues again, as it did at the hearing on the provisional measures, that the wording of Article 8 indicates that it is Article 8 rather than Article 9 that enables a non-injured contracting party to the Convention to seize the court to resolve a dispute with another contracting party. The primary basis of Myanmar's argument is that the court is one of the quote-unquote competent organs of the United Nations. But as the court explained in its order of 23 January 2020, although the terms competent organs of the United Nations under Article 8 are broad and may be interpreted as encompassing, the court within their application. Other terms used in Article 8 suggest a different interpretation. In particular, the court noted that Article 8 only addresses in general terms the possibility for any contracting party to call upon the competent organs of the United Nations to take action which is appropriate for the prevention and suppression of genocide. As the court continued, Article 8 does not refer to the submission of disputes between contracting parties to the Genocide Convention to the court for adjudication, which is a matter specifically addressed in Article 9 of the Convention. Indeed, as the Gambia explained in its written observations, the court as a judicial institution does not take actions under the United Nations Charter. Rather, in exercising jurisdiction in contentious cases, the court renders legal judgments in accordance with Article 38.1 of the statute. Nor are the judgments based on what it considers appropriate, as Article 8 requires. Such judgments are rendered solely on the basis of international law. The court may only decide a case ex aqua e bono if the parties agree thereto. The conclusion that Article 8 does not address the season of the court is further confirmed by its use of the words call upon to describe the contracting party's engagement with the competent organs of the United Nations. These words are employed in connection with appeals to the exercise of discretion. The Oxford English Dictionary defines call upon as meaning to appeal to a person, organization, etc., to do something to require, urge, or demand that a person, organization, etc., do something. Call upon is not a formulation that ordinarily describes the initiation of judicial proceedings, and even Myanmar does not attempt to suggest otherwise. Instead, Myanmar invites the tribunal to consider the French and Spanish versions of the Genocide Convention, which use saisir and recurrir respectively for the term call upon. 
The argument fares no better in these languages. Both terms are also commonly used to refer to appeals to political and security authorities, as reflected in the definitions of the terms that Myanmar itself submitted before the court. Madam President, the ordinary meaning of the terms of Article 8 simply do not permit the reading that the article seeks to govern the season of the court in a dispute between two contracting parties. Neither do the object nor purpose of Article 8 offer assistance to Myanmar. Myanmar contends that Article 8 must be understood as regulating the right of a non-injured contracting party to bring a case to the court, otherwise Article 8 would be devoid of any meaningful object and purpose. But as God, Judge Gaia explained in his commentary, Article 8 could be construed as implying that all the contracting states accept that a matter referred to under Article 8 of the Convention does not pertain to domestic jurisdiction, and therefore, as removing the barrier raised by Article 2.7 of the UN Charter to UN Security Council engagement. In fact, Myanmar's parliamentary discussions upon ratifying the Genocide Convention demonstrate that its Article 8 reservation was motivated precisely by a concern about this sort of interference with its domestic jurisdiction. Myanmar explained that it entered reservations to Article 8 and Article 7, which preserves the rights of domestic courts to hear cases of genocide, because of its belief that, I quote, what happens internally in a country concerns the people of that country, and outside interference is undesirable for what happens internally in a state party, end quote. Significantly, at that time, Myanmar confirmed that except for Articles 8 and Article 7 of the Convention, it supported all the other ones. The words, all the other ones, encompass Article 9. I come to the third and final point of my submission, Madam President. The Genocide Convention's preparatory works confirm that Article 8 is unrelated to the season of the court under Article 9. You heard Professor Kolb inform you on Monday that the travaux préparatoires of the Genocide Convention confirm that Article 8 governs all principal UN organs, including the court. He omitted, however, discussion of any of this preparatory work, because doing so would show quite the opposite. Article 8 was only intended to govern the political organs of the United Nations and not the court, which was addressed in Article 9. Right from the outset of the drafting procedure, Article 8 and Article 9 were envisioned as addressing distinct matters. In the 1947 draft text of the Convention, prepared by the UN Secretariat, engagement of the UN's organs was addressed in draft Article 12, the forerunner of what would become Article 8, which was entitled, Action by the United Nations to Prevent or Stop Genocide. Significantly, the draft is e elected to locate the compromissory clause in a different part of the Convention, then Article 14, which bore the title Settlement of Disputes on Interpretation or Application of the Convention. The report of the Ad Hoc Committee records that draft Article 8 was discussed at length when the Committee considered questions of principle and again when the Articles of the Convention were being drafted. Yet there is no evidence that any of the participants ever suggested that Article 8 should govern the season of the court. As Professor, Professor Kolb himself recognized on Monday, it would normally be, quote, unquote, absurd to consider that a compromissory clause such as Article 9 would govern the competence of the court, but not its season. Surely then, the drafter's decision to observe, adopt the absurd approach of placing the season of the court in a separate article from that containing the compromissory clause would have warranted some discussion during the drafting negotiations. But none is evident, nor is there any indication that the participants intended to establish different obligations for contracting parties to seize the court depending on the extent to which they were injured by genocidal acts. The text of Article 8 made no distinction between the ability of injured 
and non-injured contracting parties to appeal to the UN organs. And evidently, the draft has so no reason to consider, let alone adopt, such a distinction. Instead, the debate on Article 8 centered on whether the article should refer specifically to the Security Council or instead not mention any specific political UN organ. Those advocating the latter view argued that although the Security Council appeared to be the organ to which governments would most frequently wish to apply, it was undesirable to rule out the General Assembly, the Economic and Social Council, or the Trusteeship Council. In some cases, it would be of advantage to call on the General Assembly because it directly expressed the opinion of all the members of the United Nations and because its decisions were taken by a majority vote with no risk of the right of veto preventing a decision. As is clear, the draft has only addressed political organs in their consideration of the scope of Article 8. The General Assembly, the Economic and Social Council, and the Trusteeship Council. There was no mention whatsoever of the court. The preparatory works show that later in the drafting process, the Sixth Committee decided to delete Article 8 by a small majority on the basis of a joint amendment by Belgium and the United Kingdom, suggesting that the article did not expand the powers of the UN organs. It was pursuant to an Australian amendment to Article 9 that Article 8 was reinstated at a subsequent meeting. The reasoning for the Australian Amendment confirms that Article 8 was intended to address appeals to the political organs of the United Nations rather than the court because recourse to the court had already been established in Article 9, then number 10. As recorded in the Sixth Committee, the Australian delegation considered that a clause should be inserted in Article 10 concerning organs of the United Nations other than the International Court of Justice which could take useful action in suppressing genocide. The purpose of reinserting Article 8 in the draft convention was therefore precisely to allow recourse to the political organs of the United Nations as distinguished from the court. The United Kingdom's explanation for voting for the adoption of Article 8 after having initially proposed its removal further confirms that the article was intended to ensure recourse to the UN's political organs. The UK delegate explained that although his delegation considered it unnecessary to include in the convention provisions conferring on the organs of the United Nations powers that they already possessed under the terms of the Charter, it had voted in favour of the Australian Amendment reinstating Article 8 in order that it may be clear beyond any doubt that his prior amendment proposing the deletion of Article 8 did not imply that recourse might be had only to the International Court of Justice to the exclusion of the other competent organs of the United Nations. The drafting history of the Convention is thus clear about the allocation of respective functions of Articles 8 and 9. The former concerns access to the UN's political organs, the latter to the Court. This is consistent with the Court's holding in its 2007 judgment in the Bosnian Genocide case that Article 8 may be seen as completing the system of the Genocide Convention by supporting both prevention and suppression, in this case at the political level, rather than as a matter of legal responsibility. Commentators on Article 8 have also concluded that Article 8 refers only to the UN's political organs. Dr. Schiffbauer, for example, explains in his commentary on Article 8 that in contrast with the initiation of strictly judicial proceedings before the ICJ, which is governed by the ICJ statute, referral to UN organs is a much more amorphous concept. Referral under Article 8 can be seen as a more political procedure, which serves as an alternative weapon in achieving the prevention and the punishment of the crime of genocide. We refer to Dr. Schiffbauer's commentary in particular because Myanmar, in its written pleading, expressly relies on that commentary for the proposition that Article 8 must not be deprived of its meaningful object and purpose. But Myanmar neglected to mention that Dr. Schiffbauer 
wrote that referral under Article 8 can be seen as a more political procedure and that it stood in contrast with the initiation of strictly judicial proceedings before the ICJ, which is covered by Article 9. Nor does Myanmar mention Dr. Shifbao's conclusion that contradicts Myanmar's foundational argument that Article 8 governs the season of the court in disputes concerning contracting parties. Consistent with the ordinary meaning of the terms of Article 8 interpreted in context and in light of its object and purpose, Dr. Shifbao concludes, Article 8 does not add to nor diminish from the court's competencies as defined by Article 9. For the scope of the court's competences, it is irrelevant. Dr. Schiffbauer is not alone. Professor Kolb himself wrote in 2009 that season of the court by a party to a dispute under the convention is governed by Article 9, not Article 8. In striking contrast with his insistence before you on Monday that Article 8 governs the season of the court and is therefore indispensable for the court season in the present dispute, in his commentary on the Genocide Convention before he was retained by Myanmar, Professor Cope was unequivocal that Article 9 allows a unilateral seizing of the ICJ by any party to a dispute. Professor Cope continued, Moreover, it must be noticed that the compromissory clause in Article 9 of the G Genocide Convention contains no further limitations, for example, as to previous negotiations. Such restrictive conditions may prompt delicate problems, all of which are avoided in the Genocide Convention. Article 9 of the Genocide is in this respect a model of clarity and simplicity, opening the seizing of the court as largely as possible. Madam President, members of the court, for all of these reasons and those set out in the Gambia's written observations, the court should once again reject Myanmar's third preliminary objection. I thank you for your courteous attention and ask that you call my colleague, Mr. Arsalan Suleiman, to address Myanmar's fourth preliminary objection. I thank Ms. Pasipanoja, and I now invite Mr. Arsalan Suleiman to address the court. You have the floor. Madam President, members of the court, it is an honor to address the court, and especially to do so again today as counsel for the Gambia. In its fourth preliminary objection, Myanmar argues that the court lacks jurisdiction or, alternatively, that the application is inadmissible because there was no dispute between the Gambia and Myanmar at the time of the filing of the application. This objection, like the others, is entirely without merit. My presentation is organized in three parts. First, I briefly recall the court's standards for determining the existence of a dispute. Second, I recount the clear factual bases that establish the existence of a dispute between the Gambia and Myanmar prior to the filing of the application. And third, I identify the various ways in which Myanmar's new standards for determining the existence of a dispute would not only run contrary to the court's jurisprudence, but would also functionally give respondent states a veto over the court's exercise of jurisdiction and graft onto the Genocide Convention a new negotiations requirement. The court's standards for establishing the existence of a dispute are well known. Indeed, the court set them out in its order of 23 January 2020 on provisional measures, so I need not dwell long on them. The court has made clear that a dispute between states exists where they hold clearly opposite views concerning the question of the performance or non-performance of certain international obligations. Also, a dispute exists when it is demonstrated on the basis of the evidence that the respondent was aware or could not have been unaware that its views were positively opposed by the applicant. 
the disagreement on a point of law or fact, a conflict of legal views or interests, or the positive opposition of the claim by one party, of one party by the other, can be established expressly or by inference. The court's use of the disjunctive or in this recitation of the pertinent standards makes clear that any one of those showings would establish the existence of a dispute. And a dispute can also be inferred from the respondent's failure to respond in circumstances where a response is called for. The court takes into account exchanges between the parties in bilateral and multilateral settings. And the exchanges should refer to the subject matter of the dispute with sufficient clarity. These are the proper standards to be applied when the court determines the existence of a dispute, and they are amply met by the facts in this case. On Monday, Mr. Staker outlined four requirements that Myanmar asserts are necessary to establish a dispute. But as discussed further below, these do not track with the court's settled jurisprudence. Madam President, both the parties' exchanges at the United Nations and the Gambia's note verbal of 11 October 2019 clearly demonstrate the existence of a dispute between the Gambia and Myanmar. The manifestations of the parties' dispute began in 2018. In May of that year, the Gambia led an effort at an OIC ministerial meeting in Dhaka to hold Myanmar accountable for its brutal violence against the Rohingya group. Myanmar reacted to this development with a statement from its Ministry of Foreign Affairs that, quote, categorically rejected, unquote, the allegations against Myanmar in the declaration issued at the end of that OIC ministerial meeting. Four months later, on 12 September 2018, the UN Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar issued its landmark report finding that Myanmar's crimes in Rakhine State were, quote, similar in nature, gravity, and scope to those that have allowed genocidal intent to be established in other contexts, end quote. The UN fact-finding mission delivered its report to Myanmar on 16 August and gave it seven days till 23 August to provide any comments or reactions. Myanmar provided none. On 25 September, just two weeks after the release of the UN mission's 2018 report, his Excellency Adama Baro, President of the Gambia, delivered remarks at the UN General Assembly. He stated that the Gambia has undertaken, through a resolution, to champion an accountability mechanism that would ensure that perpetrators of the terrible crimes against the Rohingya Muslims are brought to book. Three days later, Speaking at the same UN General Assembly forum, Myanmar's former co-agent in these proceedings, Yu Kyo Tin Shui, dismissed the UN mission's findings as, quote, based on narratives and not on hard evidence, end quote. The parties' exchanges continued into 2019, further demonstrating the clearly opposed views of the Gambia and Myanmar. First, OIC resolutions from March 2019, promoted by the Gambia, continued to condemn Myanmar's crimes, including genocide, against the Rohingya, and called for accountability. Myanmar, again, officially reacted to these resolutions, demonstrating its awareness of the opposing positions of the parties. Then, in May 2019, in a statement at the conclusion of an OIC summit conference, the member states of the OIC, quote, urged upon the ad hoc ministerial committee led by the Gambia to take immediate measures to launch the case at the International Court of Justice on behalf of the OIC, end of quote. The UN fact-finding mission took notice of the Gambia's efforts and the OIC summit statement regarding a potential claim before this court. 
In its report of 8 August 2019, the UN mission affirmed its conclusion that Myanmar incurs state responsibility under the prohibition against genocide. And it welcomed the efforts of the Gambia to encourage and pursue a case against Myanmar before the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. Myanmar received a copy of this report for comment eight days in advance of its publication. It chose not to respond. The UN mission's detailed report of 16 September 2019 was also provided to Myanmar five days in advance. Again, Myanmar chose not to respond. The detailed report found that Myanmar continues to harbor genocidal intent and that the Rohingya remain under serious risk of genocide. It also welcomed the Gambia's efforts to pursue a case against Myanmar before the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. These UN fact-finding mission reports demonstrate both the existence and international recognition of the opposing views of the Gambia and Myanmar in regard to Myanmar's responsibility for genocide. And they provide the context for further statements by officials of the Gambia and Myanmar at the United Nations General Assembly meeting in September 2019. At that General Assembly meeting on 26 September 2019, Her Excellency Mrs. Isatu Ture, Vice President of the Gambia, announced the Gambia's intention to lead concerted efforts to take the Rohingya issue to the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. Two days later, Myanmar's former co-agent, Yu Kyo Tin Shui, again dismissed the UN mission's reports as, quote, biased and flawed based on facts, but on, based not on facts, but on narratives, unquote. And he noted in particular that, quote, the latest reports are even worse, unquote. As the court concluded in its order of January 2020, quote, these statements made by the parties before the United Nations General Assembly suggest the existence of a divergence of views concerning the events which allegedly took place in Rakhine State in relation to the Rohingya. Indeed, that is certainly the case. The Gambia's actions and statements in 2018 and 2019 indicate that it agreed with the UN fact-finding mission that genocidal acts were committed by Myanmar against the Rohingya in violation of its obligations under the Genocide Convention, and that the Gambia would bring a case under the Convention to this court to hold Myanmar accountable under the Convention. It was equally evident from Myanmar's statements and actions that it rejected such findings, which it had described as, quote, biased and unflawed, biased and flawed, unquote regarding its treatment of the Rohingya. In sum, taken as a whole, the parties' exchanges at the United Nations demonstrate that they held clearly opposite views concerning Myanmar's fulfillment of its obligations under the Genocide Convention, and that they disagreed about the facts and legal implications of Myanmar's anti-Rohingya clearance operations in Rakhine State. Madam President, by then, there was no doubt about Myanmar's awareness of a dispute with the Gambia over compliance with its obligations under the Genocide Convention. The Gambia's note verbal of 11 October 2019 offers further confirmation. Mr. Staker asked the court to look at this two-page document. I agree. Please do as you deliberate over Myanmar's fourth preliminary objection. It is located in your judges folder at tab three. Mr. Staker asked, what facts does it refer to? His answer was, quote, none at all, end quote. That is an astonishing statement. In clear terms, 
the note verbal invoked the findings of the UN fact-finding mission regarding the ongoing Rohingya genocide, and I quote, in particular, its findings regarding the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya people of Myanmar in violation of Myanmar's obligations under the Genocide Convention, end quote. Mr. Staker asserts that there was, quote, no suggestion that the Gambia had access to or could itself evaluate the FFM's evidence. Perhaps he forgets that the fact-finding mission reports are public and contain literally hundreds of pages of findings of fact based on direct witness testimony from over 600 victims, satellite imagery, and stakeholder consultations, among other sources of evidence, all of which support its conclusions that Myanmar committed acts of genocide against the Rohingya. Is it Mr. Staker's argument that unless the Gambia had compiled all of this evidence on its own, it could not rely on the UN mission's evidence to assert facts that Myanmar disputed? As regards the existence of a dispute on the law, Mr. Staker says, and I quote, there is not even any positive allegation of the Gambia's own that Myanmar is in breach of international law. Yet again, the text of the note verbal, like the speech of the Gambia's vice president before the UN General Assembly, shows otherwise. The note, referring to the UN fact-finding mission's findings, declared the Gambia's positive opposition to Myanmar's, quote, absolute denial of those findings and its refusal to acknowledge and remedy its responsibility for the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya population of Myanmar as required under the Genocide Convention and customary international law. In the note, the Gambia rejected in explicit terms, I quote, Myanmar's denial of its responsibility for the ongoing genocide against Myanmar's Rohingya population and its refusal to fulfill its obligations under the Genocide Convention and customary international law. The note even refers back to and specifically incorporates the contents of the OIC resolutions of March 2019, including the language calling on Myanmar to honor its obligations under international law to cease all genocidal acts against the Rohingya. And after noting its view that Myanmar was committing further breaches of the obligations under the Genocide Convention, the Gambia insisted that Myanmar take all necessary steps to comply with those legal obligations, including through making reparations to the victims and providing guarantees and assurances of non-repetition. In summary, the note verbal explicitly articulated the party's clearly opposed views regarding Myanmar's fulfillment of its obligations under the Genocide Convention and customary international law as it relates to Myanmar's genocidal acts against the Rohingya. Myanmar does not deny having received the note. In this way, it was absolutely aware of the dispute as articulated therein. Madam President, Myanmar's lack of response to the note verbal in the face of grave allegations that merit a response provides further indication that a dispute existed between the parties. 30 days passed from the time Myanmar received the Gambia's note without a response or any indication that one would be forthcoming. On the 31st day, with the existence of a dispute indisputably established, the Gambia filed its application with the court. In reference to the note verbal, Mr. Staker also asked on Monday, I quote, should Myanmar at the time have understood it as making a specific legal claim calling for a response? For this question, we can rely on Myanmar's own representations to supply the answer. Its government spokesperson stated on 16 November 2019 that Myanmar, quote, had expected over a month before that Myanmar could face a suit at the ICJ. 
Given this clear and unequivocal admission by the respondent state, its contention that it was unaware that a dispute existed at the time that the Gambia's application was filed is entirely lacking in credibility, as is Mr. Staker's argument. Madam President, in the face of this incontrovertible evidence of the existence of a dispute between the parties under the court's well-established standards, Myanmar now seeks to apply new, heightened standards for determining the existence of a dispute. These are contrary to the court's jurisprudence, reflect bad policy, and must be rejected. First, in its written pleadings, Myanmar argues that as a general matter, or at least as regards cases such as this one, the court's alternative grounds for establishing the existence of a dispute must be cumulatively established. Myanmar offers no legal support for its proposal because none exists. There is no case law from the court that would support this position. In fact, this view directly contradicts the court's jurisprudence, which shows that the different ways of establishing a dispute are disjunctive and not cumulative. The court's use of the disjunctive or enlisting the various ways of proving the existence of a dispute in Cameroon v. Nigeria directly proves this point. Mr. Staker did not present this argument on Monday, so perhaps it is now abandoned. Second, Myanmar seeks to revisit the court's decision in the nuclear arms and disarmament cases. In addition to the court's holding that a respondent a respondent's awareness of the applicant's clearly opposed views would suffice to establish a dispute, Myanmar adds that the applicant must then provide evidence that it was made aware of the respondent's specific opposition to the applicant's claims. No such requirement can be found in any of the court's jurisprudence. Myanmar's imposition of an additional hurdle for the filing of an application would require the applicant state to show that it received an express indication from the respondent state of its opposition to the applicant's claims before it could bring its claims to the court. This, of course, would conveniently allow a potential respondent state to defeat the court's jurisdiction by remaining silent even when faced with statements by the applicant in regard to a dispute between the two parties that call for a response. Article 9 of the Genocide Convention imposes no such impediment to the exercise of the court's jurisdiction, and there is no reason for the court to invent one. Myanmar's proposal, which would effectively give a respondent the power to exercise a silent veto over the court's jurisdiction is particularly unattractive in the context of a claim of genocide. If accepted by the court, it would become an instruction manual for how to avoid accountability for breach of the obligations imposed by the convention, including, as is the case here, the, for the commission of genocide itself. In this context, Mr. Staker explained that this new standard would require, I quote, both parties to articulate their legal positions to each other before a case is brought. This is to allow, he says, friendly settlement of disputes between the parties. Here, Myanmar has articulated a new negotiations requirement where the applicant would have to give the respondent a chance to articulate its legal views before the possibility of filing an application. Article 9 of the Genocide Convention contains no such negotiation requirement, and neither does the court's jurisprudence on the existence of a dispute. Third, Myanmar asserts that a potential respondent state must be aware of all the facts related to all the legal claims that an applicant raises, as well as the provisions of international law said to have been breached. Myanmar's demand for such quote-unquote particularity about the potential claims, the facts underlying them, and the legal provisions at issue 
is tantamount to a requirement that the applicant share a draft of the application before it is filed. There is no basis for such a demand. The court's jurisprudence only requires that the exchanges between the parties refer to the subject matter of the dispute with sufficient clarity. Plainly, that was the case here. Both the exchanges at the United Nations and the text of the Gambia's note verbal make the subject matter in dispute clear and obvious. Moreover, the note even specified the primary factual bases for the dispute. In other words, the evidence gathered and conclusions reached by the UN fact-finding mission, as well as the legal instruments and principles at issue, namely the Genocide Convention and related customary international law obligations. Finally, Myanmar also seeks to create a new standard providing respondents with an undefined amount of time to react to an applicant's potential claims to show an acceptance or rejection of its claims. As applied to this case, they say that Myanmar was not given sufficient time to respond to the note verbal and that its lack of response by 11 November 2019 did not indicate its positive opposition to the note. But Myanmar's opposition to the Gambia's claims was manifest even before the note verbal itself. Indeed, the note documented that opposition. Myanmar consistently denied allegations of genocide, rejected the reports of the UN fact-finding mission, and rejected the OIC resolutions invoked in the note verbal. Myanmar had 30 days to respond to it before the application was filed, which was ample time to do so, especially in light of its admission on 16 November that it had anticipated the filing of the application for over a month, that is, since its receipt of the note verbal. Madam President, in the grave circumstance of acts that amount to a genocide, 30 days was more than sufficient time for Myanmar to react to the note verbal and deny the existence of a dispute if that were the case. There was nothing new in the Gambia's note that had not already been alleged in the Gambia's statements at the United Nations, which Myanmar had emphatically rejected. Madam President, members of the court, for the reasons I have just given and also those set out in our written observations, Myanmar's fourth preliminary objection must be rejected. I thank you for your usual kind attention. May I ask you, Madam President, to kindly call Professor Philippe Sands to the microphone to provide the Gambia's final pleading in this round. I thank Mr. Suleiman, and I now invite Professor Philippe Sands to take the floor. Madam President, members of the court, it is a privilege and a responsibility to address you today on behalf of the Gambia in a case of singular importance for the court, for the rule of law, and for the international community as a whole. My task is to conclude the first round of the Gambia's submissions in response to Myanmar's preliminary objections. We invite you to reject each and every one of Myanmar's four preliminary objections for the reasons set out in detail in the submissions put to you by my distinguished colleagues. Those submissions have set out with crystal clarity why none of Myanmar's preliminary objections pass legal scrutiny. None provides any conceivable basis for this court to refuse jurisdiction or to find that the Gambia's application is inadmissible. Indeed, in brief summary of the points made to you by my colleagues demonstrating the lack of substance of Myanmar's objections. First, the real and only applicant in this case is the Gambia, as Mr. Lowenstein has set out and as the Gambia's agent has compellingly confirmed. Myanmar's argument that another entity should be viewed as the applicant is novel, it's unprecedented, unsupported by any facts, and it's unbecoming. The Gambia is a sovereign nation just like any other. It is not anyone's proxy, and the fact that it is a member of 
and has worked with an international organization is wholly irrelevant. Second, the Gambia has standing to bring this case against Myanmar. As Professor Darjean has explained, Article 9 of the Convention does not preclude this case, whether as an actio popularis or for any other reason. Indeed, the arguments Myanmar advanced on this preliminary objection are particularly tenuous. Professor Talmon suggested, rather optimistically if I may say, that the fact that no non-injured state has brought an application in the seven-decade history of the Convention may be taken as indicative of agreement by states that they would not have had standing to do so. But no such conclusion can be drawn from that fact. As the Court will have noted, the United Nations General Assembly welcomed the Court's Provisional Measures Order, which tends to confirm that the body and its member states do consider the Gambia's standing to be established. Yet even that was not the most surprising or the weakest of Myanmar's arguments. How astonishing it was to hear Professor Talmon argue that an application under the Genocide Convention cannot be brought except by a state whose nationals are the victims of genocide. The argument drives a coach and horses through the entire rationale of the Convention, reflecting, as it does, an attempt to address the horrors of the events that occurred between 1933 and 1945. Mr. Talmon's argument would allow states to treat their nationals entirely as they wish. It would remove all protections of the Genocide Convention when a state turns on its own people. Under this approach, a state would be free to annihilate an entire religious, racial or ethnic group without legal challenge under the Convention, so long as the victims were its own nationals. The argument is ahistorical, it's absurd, and it is totally unsupported by the text or negotiating history of the Convention, as he well knows. We trust the Court will consign this argument to the heap in which it belongs. Third, the idea that Myanmar should be able to invoke the reservation it has entered under Article 8 of the Convention to argue for a de facto reservation under Article 9 is entirely fanciful, as Ms. Pasipanodja has explained. As the Court made clear in its order of January 2020, Articles 8 and 9 of the Convention have, and I quote, distinct areas of application, end of quote, and quote, it is only Article 9 of the Convention which is relevant to the season of the Court in the present case, end of quote. The preliminary objections phase of a case is not an appeal mechanism from a ruling made in a provisional measures phase, particularly when there's been no change in or understanding of the law to be applied. And fourth, there's plainly a dispute between the Gambia and Myanmar, as Mr. Suleiman has explained. The court's criteria for determining the existence of a dispute are clear, and the evidentiary record before the court plainly establish that those criteria were met by the time the Gambia's application was filed. Myanmar's approach to the elucidation of different criteria or standards disregards the court's jurisprudence. It would give a respondent state, in effect, a veto over the court's exercise of jurisdiction. The legal position in respect of these preliminary objections is, we submit, clear and obvious. To say that the arguments of Myanmar are tantamount to clutching at straws would be generous. It would require you to redefine both the act of clutching and the nature of straw. As my colleagues have demonstrated, the Gambia has brought an application fully in accordance with the rules of the court and subject to the provisions of the Convention. And in so doing, the Gambia has carefully followed the practice of the court over its 75-year history. Article 36 of the Statute of the Court, in combination with Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, confers the necessary jurisdiction. So too does the Convention confer standing on the Gambia. It is the applicant in this matter, and its application to the Court is admissible. These, then, are the technical requirements for the case to proceed, and they are all satisfied in the circumstances of this case. But there is a broader point to make by way of closing. 
As Myanmar itself observes in its written preliminary objections, the Genocide Convention is a treaty of singular importance in the history of modern international law, one of the most fundamental multilateral treaties of our time. To have invoked the 1948 Convention is a matter of utmost gravity. It is not something to be done lightly, and I hope you will be able to see that it was not done lightly in this case. The Gambia proceeded very carefully in deciding how to proceed. It took account of reports of United Nations investigators and the inquiries of other third parties. It consulted with other states and with international organizations. It sent its Attorney General, a former prosecutor at the ICTR, who knows a genocide when he sees one, to the camps in Bangladesh to see for himself what was going on, to listen to personal accounts of what was being reported. And the Gambia took independent advice on whether the conditions met the definition of a genocide. On this basis, after reflection and the passage of some time, it decided to act. And this is exactly the conduct that the Convention demands of its parties, and exactly the purpose for which the Convention was adopted. The Court itself has previously observed, and I quote, the Convention was manifestly adopted for a purely humanitarian and civilizing purpose. It is indeed difficult to imagine a Convention that might have this dual character to a greater degree, since its object on the one hand is to safeguard the very existence of certain human groups, and on the other, to confirm and endorse the most elementary principles of morality. End of quote. This court bears a responsibility in upholding the object of the Convention. As the Gambia observed at the last hearing on this application, this court, the International Court of Justice, is the ultimate guardian of the Genocide Convention and the world's eyes are once again turned to this court. The Gambia is acutely aware of the responsibility that it invokes of you, the court and the judges, and at the same time of its own responsibilities, shared by all parties to the Convention, to promote and secure the Convention's aims. And it is with that responsibility in mind the Gambia has brought this application before the court, abiding by the court's own exhortation to, and I quote, carefully ascertain that all the requisite conditions for the jurisdiction of the court have been met at the time proceedings are instituted. End of quote. Conversely, Myanmar's preliminary objections are, frankly, in direct conflict with the aims which the Genocide Convention pursues. If they succeeded in whole or in part, they would seriously undermine the value of the Convention and its protections. On Monday, Myanmar evoked the prospect of an unmanageable proliferation, as it put it, of disputes if the court were to find that it had jurisdiction and that the Gambia has standing. Really? Did the floodgates open after your unanimous ruling on prima facie jurisdiction in the provisional measures phase? No, they did not. Will they open if the court, as it surely must, recognizes jurisdiction in this phase? No. They will not, because it is fundamental to the Convention and to any functioning legal order that its parties be equipped to hold each other to account by the institution of proceedings before this Court whenever there has been an apparent breach. Without that, and if, for example, Myanmar were right that only the most affected party would have standing to bring an application, or, now as it argues, only the party whose own nationals with the victims, the efficacy of the Convention would be so attenuated by the inability to enforce it that it would quickly become a dead letter, and this Court would be toothless. An argument that would be, produce such a result cannot be allowed to prevail. If I may be permitted, it might be helpful to share a brief anecdote to illustrate the, the significance of the 1948 Convention and this case. In November 2019, shortly before the oral hearings were held in the provisional measures phase, I was in Washington DC participating at an academic event. I shared the panel with a distinguished former judge of this court, the International Court of Justice, 
a man who had, as a small boy, been imprisoned at the Auschwitz concentration camp under the care of a doctor, one Joseph Mengele. Can you imagine, my fellow panellist at that academic event said, if back then, in the 1940s, there had been a treaty like the 1948 Convention, and a faraway country had invoked it before an international court to argue the inhumane treatment of those held at such a place was not permitted under international law. And that is the stark significance of the 1948 Convention and of the existence of this international court and of the unanimous ruling this court handed down in January 2020. No, this court ruled, this kind of behaviour is not permissible under international law. And yes, this court added, we are entitled to decide at this provisional measure stage at the instance of a third state. There was no question of the law of nationality then. Myanmar didn't even advance the argument. It's concocted. There's no proper place for such a concept to be introduced now. Indeed, two years on, Myanmar seems to wish to roll the clock back to an earlier era. It wants you to rule that the Genocide Convention and the protections it seeks to afford to vulnerable groups across the globe should be turned into nothing. And we trust this court will not do that. We trust that this court will rule that the 1948 Convention, so carefully elaborated, has real meaning and effect, that it goes to the very heart of human existence, that it seeks to achieve something profound and fundamental in the international legal order by ensuring the right of groups to exist and to hold to account those who threaten such existence and by recognising the right of a third state, which is a party to that convention, to invoke the rights and obligations it proclaims here in the Great Hall of Justice. Madam President, this is not the first genocide case heard by the court. In the previous cases in which this court has heard well-grounded applications alleging breach of the Genocide Convention, it has always resisted the invitation made on each occasion to refuse jurisdiction. It has charted a course that ensures that, and I quote, its basic judicial functions are safeguarded, end of quote. It has held that it is free to show some realism and flexibility where necessary to find that jurisdiction exists, although no such realism and flexibility is needed in this case where the law is clear and the facts are deplorable. But the court's overture to realism reflects an understanding of the importance of its role and an unwillingness to permit concocted technicalities to interfere with its exercise of its proper judicial function. The exercise of its jurisdiction over the merits shall not be frustrated, the court has ruled. And we ask the court to consider the ramifications if it did refuse jurisdiction in this case. Such an outcome would be seriously damaging to the operation of the Convention and to the international legal order. But alongside that, and more urgently, it would be especially damaging to the Rohingya group, as the court found in its provisional measures order unanimously. There is a prima facie case of genocide, and insofar as the provisional measures serve a protection function, that is because there is a continuing risk of genocide against the Rohingya. Now, you've heard in the submissions from Mr. Reichler about the worrisome developments and conflict that have arisen in Myanmar since the provisional measures order. That turmoil can only increase the risk that exists and the threat which the remaining Rohingya face. It makes it ever more critical that the court proceed expeditiously to the merit stage of these proceedings and that in the meantime it continues to enforce the protective provisional measures order. Indeed, the change of regime in Myanmar, while concerning on a political level, does nothing to alter the basic legal position with which the court is confronted, either at this stage or subsequently. In respect of the issues with which the court is concerned at this hearing, the jurisdiction and admissibility requirements remain satisfied. There is a clear and compelling case for this application to progress to consideration of the merits. Madam President, 
Members of the court, this brings to a conclusion the first round of arguments by the Gambia. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank Professor Sands, whose statement brings to an end the first round of oral argument. The court will reconvene on Friday, 25 February 2022 at 3 p.m. to hear Myanmar's second round of oral pleadings. At the end of that sitting, Myanmar will present its final submissions. The Gambia will present its second round of oral argument on Monday, 28 February 2022 at 3 p.m. At the end of that sitting, the Gambia will also present its final submissions. Each party will have a maximum of one hour and a half to present it, its arguments for the second round. As the parties and their counsel turn to their preparation for the second round of these oral proceedings, I take this opportunity to remind them of Article 60, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court, pursuant to which the oral statements are to be as succinct as possible. The Court has emphasized this requirement in Practice Direction 6. The parties should not use the second round to repeat statements that they have previously made. The second round is an opportunity to respond to points that were made earlier in these oral proceedings. Moreover, the parties are not obliged to use all the time allotted to them. The sitting is adjourned.